Okay. Hello. Yes. Uh, so next speaker is uh, Mr. Matthew, um, Matthew Gatt, the CEO of Mita, Malta Information Technology Agency. Uh, we have had a long-lasting um, relationship with Mita. They're a very effective agency um, working with uh, e-government and all kinds of educational issues uh, in ICT, etc. And um, of particular uh, interest uh, to us and, and uh, very compelling is that they actually have a white paper on open source in government. A green white paper, actually. I, I guess we will cover that. So, happy. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, Dr. Susie Orlando, Gary, Christina. Thank you very much for, for having us. I think we can switch to a slideshow. It's, uh, there. Basically, I just wanted to introduce very briefly the Malta Information Technology Agency. A small country, a very small country, and the construct of an IP agency really has evolved over the years to what is now a multi felix agency in the sense that we don't only do traditional IT infrastructure work, so we've got miles of cable, hundreds of hundreds of servers, data centers, etc. But more importantly, we've moved into other dimensions where we're very focused on the government very focused on the public facing delivery of customer IT and the skills based industry to drive the knowledge based economy. The knowledge based economy we see for Malta needs IT and it needs IT not just in the niche areas around technology but to enable practically every form of activity, whether it's gaming, finances, industry, general social well-being, health, the diversity of the portfolio we see growing today is enormous. Um, I'm sure you have been here uh, for a couple of days, you will see some, some key, but behind it all, we have location possibilities for some of the biggest investment funds in Europe, small development communities for locating gaming regulatory functions in Malta and many, many other niche industries employing 50, 60, 100 people which create the ecosystem around the IT concept of our knowledge economy. Earlier this year we, we published an open source white paper. And I won't bore you with the details, but what governments do really is foster an environment to promote growth in certain directions. And the white paper does that. It articulates that we won't put up any barriers to open source, etc. reduce the perception that open source may be not really a procurable asset, etc. More importantly, I think we looked internally to see what value we were actually uh, what value we were actually something's going wrong with the uh, technology okay. what value we were actually acquiring when we bought solutions and increasingly we realised that we were moving as a trend in, in many other industries away from endpoint licensing closer to core licensing, not necessarily reducing cost, but reducing the cost of growth, the cost of promoting solutions, the cost of deploying solutions, and more importantly, opening up to, to community-based uh, support. And although in our statistics you see, you probably run so many Linux servers, etc., you won't see any of graphs or anything like that on how many, for example, JPA instances we find running on our uh, machines. We have to run on every machine, it's not really safe, taken for granted, uh, and that's the success of really looking towards how the dynamic of our industry is changing. So really this, this 
construct brought you to look at it more that how cyber culture is meeting the corporate environment. And today, uh, new employees, digital natives, don't really expect the type of corporate solution which governments have spent millions and millions and millions of dollars. Zero cost of provisioning is here with us today. When we purchase, we very rarely purchase on user based licensing as companies. We tend to purchase cycling in bulk, company wide license, and that means practically everybody in the civil service and public sector will have access to that tool. Alternatively, we look very closely at server side logic and the scalability of the server side components. And this has started to shift the way we look at procurement tool. We have to accept that community-based components will start to become mainstream. And that means when we're investing in governance solutions, things like, listen, can you guarantee you will have the latest patch on the machine as issued? And can you mitigate the security risks of that? Are starting to take a different flavor. Because you realize that to protect the core, you have to buy the support we need to protect the core, and that creates the industry opportunities locally for that value-added service on the open source components, but increasingly moving away from buying the desktop and licensing and the core construct of how we invest in taking that forward. And that's where we start to see the opportunities of the industry we try to promote with, with Marsec over the past couple of years. A small cluster of specialized people looking precisely at how they can start to break <coughs> the traditional business model. How they can start to create value, not necessarily in the tradition of core IP stack, intellectual property stack of the software industry, but looking at the far more fundamental models which, if you look at the theory of cyber culture, is telling us to come our way. So really today, and from the agenda, I think we'll have some very exciting input. When we look at the island of open source, we need to look beyond what we published as we done in the white paper, but look really at what that white paper was fostering. And what it was fostering was the unwritten objective, was the disruptive potential to have as a country. And that potential really is looking at how we can shift our structures, not only from all down, but looking at encouraging the relocation of ecosystems, business ecosystems, particularly around IT, will not be bound by your traditional physical geography. It's now more looking at things like jurisdiction and gaming and financial institutions in particular will not look at physical boundaries of your infrastructure because you have that that's taken for granted. They will look at the legislative constructs, the skill sets, and how those can give them an ecosystem from which they can operate. We have this, we're fostering growth, particularly in the academic side. The number and the diversity of academic portfolios you can gain from our own educational institutions have broadened enormously, and we see now that industries which want to grow <coughs> by disrupting an established model need to look at the opportunities of open source. Open source will offer them the scalability and the growth without requiring enormous leverage in their cost structures. The <coughs> ratios for investment the ratios for marketing, the ratios for deployment, all of those ratios change when you look at the open source model. It's not about open source in government, it's about looking at the niche industries who can really disrupt the potential. What we're seeing from Marsec, the initiatives from Marsec, can be readily mirrored in the automotive sector. On my iPhone, plug into my car, get an accelerometer on my iPhone, see how fast I'm going, do the measured mile, I can do it all on my iPhone for a few <coughs> minutes application. It's not 
necessarily open source, but it indicates that cyber culture has moved from big corporate investments at the user side to marginal, trivial, or free applications connecting to open standards, looking at how those interrelate, driving up the value, looking at the products, getting the venture capital, and getting that product to market. And I think, in a nutshell, if we touch on those in this session, we have brought enormous value beyond just the technology discussion around you know, which database and which collection is really the product value we need for our economy to grow. Thank you very much, and hope you have a fruitful day. <coughs>